right, so we've heard a lot today uh, about kids and kids' bills and all these important things, and we obviously just heard the very powerful testimony from Kristen. And in that, she raised the Age Appropriate Design Code Act from California. And we were fortunate enough to have one of the two co-authors with us today, Republican from California, Jordan Cunningham. And Jordan is representing the 35th district, which encompasses San Luis Obispo County, portions of Santa Barbara County, which is one of the loveliest parts of California, by the way, if you have not been out there. Uh, prior to being elected to the state assembly, he was a school board trustee at, at uh, Templeton Unified School District and the deputy district attorney for San Luis Obispo County. Uh, his career started as a prosecutor with San Luis Obispo County District Attorney's Office. And we are really grateful to have Assemblymember Cunningham here today. Over to you, Assembly Member. Um, Jordan, if, if you've heard us, Assembly Member, we're kicking it over to you for your talk, please. Assembly member, can you hear us there? We still yeah, I can hear you now. All right. Thank you all for being with us. All right. I just introduced you. It was a fantastic introduction of your bio. Everyone was riveted. Um, so now I'm gonna kick it over to you. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Council for Responsible Social Media for the opportunity to join you guys via Zoom. I'm in the central coast of California. Uh, and I was asked to speak uh, as one of the two. Uh, co-authors of the Bipartisan Age Appropriate Design Code Bill that was signed into law by the governor uh, in September. Uh, so I want to talk about the bill, but first I'll ask you to do sort of an overview of the last four years or so of our legislative activities in the space of privacy and protecting children online. I think we learned a lot of lessons, some of which we uh, put to good use this year in getting age appropriate design uh, passed and to the governor and signed into law. Uh, and let me start by saying this council, I think, is exactly what the world needs at this point in time. Uh, mm -hmm. We need a, a national level organization that uh, co can coordinate, can advocate, uh, because if we don't get this social media thing right uh, and impose some accountability and some common sense reform, I think we're going to see continuation of what I believe is, is generational harm uh, to young folks. And I say that not just as a legislator. Uh, as a practicing attorney and a father of four kids, uh, three of them are teenagers. So my wife and I are, are living this stuff in, in our household as well as uh, is dealing with it at work. Uh, in 2018, California sort of started things off in the privacy space by passing the first in the nation uh, California Consumer Privacy Act. Uh, part of the negotiations of getting that enacted into law, uh, we built on that in 2019 and started uh, I led a group of bipartisan legislators to introduce the Your Data, Your Way Data Privacy Package of bills. One of those bills was a simple, a simple social media parental consent. For 16 and under, you have to get verification from your parents if you were uh, authorized to start a social media account. Uh, the first year we introduced that bill, uh, that was successful at killing it on the assembly floor. Uh, we brought it back the second year. Uh, we lowered the age to 12 and under. So if you're 12 and under, you've got to get verified parental consent to open up an account. Uh, we moved that all the way to the governor, and it got veto. Uh, so we definitely took some months along the way, and that and various other bills. Uh, and we learned a few things. We learned, uh, first of all, some people thought we were crazy to go after big tech. Uh, they have tremendous cloud in Sacramento, as they do, I believe, in Washington, D.C. Uh, it opened a rip uh, with the Chamber of Commerce that I never fully repaired. Uh, but we learned a ton. We learned, in part, some of the dubious tactics they will employ in lobbying against the bill. First of all, they've got an entire armada uh, of lobbyists. Uh, they deploy them. They use generic-sounding, astroturfy, uh, supposed grassroots organizations. They use front groups uh, like TechNet, uh, the Chamber of Progress, things of that sort, uh, so that the individual companies don't necessarily have to uh, come out in opposition to a particular bill. Uh, to oppose our smart speaker privacy bill that was part of our original package. 
uh, that company actually paid a supposed disability rights organization from out of state, which was essentially one guy sitting in his room in Virginia uh, to lobby against the bill and testify against it in committee. Uh, Tech would tell other legislators that you were unwilling to take industry amendments they offered when they hadn't ever offered any amendments. Uh, that was a very common tactic. But what we learned in 2019 and 2020 and into 2021 uh, set us up for a major victory in 2022. Uh, we passed the nation's first age-appropriate design code bill, AB 2273, as I mentioned, and that bill required big tech to design their products with the child's best interest in mind. Anybody that offers uh, their platform online, be it app, be it online, web browser, whatever it is, uh, and allows minors to access that product, uh, have, they have to do things to make sure that that product is safe for children's use, such as uh, we've seen this implemented in the United Kingdom. We modeled the bill after the successful law in the UK. Uh, we've seen uh, default settings for minors, uh, disabled geolocation, default minors into the highest privacy setting, disabling 24-hour push notifications. So uh, you can't be pinged all night when, you're trying, when your, your teenager is trying to sleep, uh, you know, getting messages all night, uh, you, know, you have to respond to so-and-so on TikTok, whatever it is. Uh, the, it has to default for minors to the highest possible privacy setting. Uh, I believe the law is going to end the practice of, uh, of uh, YouTube and other things that do uh, autoplay. So, you know, you sit your eight-year-old down in front of a particular cartoon they're watching on YouTube, and the next thing you know, they're watching, you know, some gory shoot them up thing because it's autoplay all the way into it. Uh, so Big Tech, by the way, they said that there's no way we can implement this spell, the age-appropriate design code, uh, when, in fact, they are already implementing uh, uh, policies and procedural changes to comply with the law in the UK, and it's working uh, just fine over there. Part of our strategy in getting this bill to the governor and to enact it into law, though, was uh, we decided to open up a two-front war. Uh, rather than have just one bill that tech didn't like, we figured, hey, hey, let's give them two targets to shoot at. So we also introduced me and my co-author Buffy Wick, Democrat from Berkeley. Uh, imagine that. Uh, we also, at the same time, we introduced the age-appropriate design code bill. We introduced the Social Media Duty to Children Act, which imposed liability through parental lawsuits and public prosecutor actions uh, on any company that used a product design feature to knowingly addict kids and cause them harm. Uh, we know as a fact that so certain social media companies are designing their products in a way that addicts kids and they're causing significant generational harm in doing that. They employ the top engineers in the world, working with the top neuroscientists in the world, to design new widgets and gizmos that get your kids hooked. And we've seen the results and they're calamitous for an entire generation, eating disorders, depression, suicide. Uh, and it, by the way, it's been mentioned in, in this summit so far, and I think it's important to note, uh, there's no other product where if you offer it to children, you don't have to design it in a way that is safe for children. Uh, the, the only, social media is literally the only product where we don't impose that sort of minimal standard of, of the, the technological equivalent of a seatbelt in a car. If you're going to have a child in a car, they've got to be in a seatbelt or, or a safety seat. Uh, our social media liability bill was uh, made it through the assembly uh, without a single no vote. It made it through the Senate Judiciary Committee without a single no vote, and it was killed in, in darkness without a vote in the Senate Appropriations Committee uh, due to the influence of, of the tech lobby. But uh, while I was disappointed to see that happen, uh, it helped us get the age-appropriate design code bill across because uh, tech had to train most of its fire on the lawsuit-oriented bill that would impose liability on them for addicting kids and harming them. Uh, and they had less firepower to train on the other bill. In fact, as we were lobbying in the Senate, uh, they were practically begging senators to pass a appropriate design code bill and vote against uh, the social media liability bill uh, because that would have hit their pocketbooks uh, considerably harder. So our two our two prong strategy, our two front war uh, works. Uh, I I won't be in the legislature in 2023. I have not to be the fourth term, but I know some of my colleagues are going to continue to try to hold big tech accountable. Uh, and lastly, before we take questions, I want to uh, leave you with this. Uh, the polling shows, and all the data shows, the voters want these reforms. They know something's being done to their kids and to this generation that is wrong. 
Uh, the parents are begging for these reforms, and the kids need these reforms. We need it at the national level. We need it at the state level. Uh, hopefully, the California law that we pass uh, will be a model that other states can use, and potentially even a model for legislation on the federal level. Um, I, I think that we have allowed big tech to conduct a decade-plus-long social experiment on the brains of kids. Uh, the data and evidence is in that it is significantly harmful. Uh, it's long, and we need to put a stop to it. Uh, and with that, I'd love to take your questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. We have time for about two or three questions. So anyone, anyone have a question? Otherwise, I have several. All right. So, Assembly Member, thank you for your leadership and and for your work on this. Uh, really would love to hear your perspective on other states. Right. You're obviously you know the California context extremely well, but how do you see this replicating? Do you, are you seeing the trickle effect? Do you really envision this going beyond California and how do you envision that going down the pike? Yeah, I do. And I think there's a couple ways that can happen. Um, one is, uh, I know New York is looking at legislation very similar to what we got passed here in California. You can see the big states sort of copycat this approach. I mean, we copycatted it essentially from the UK. I mean, we had to modify it somewhat because California's got 27 different code books. So it gets a little more complex. But um, I think other states can copy it. I think this could be something that's implemented at the federal level. Uh, we've been waiting for action out of DC. I, I think there's some good ideas on the table. Uh, I hope that we don't see federal preemption of any state uh, state laws and any bill that gets passed. That's sort of my fear. Uh, but I think there's a couple different avenues. There's copycat by states. There's uh, DC sort of using this as a model. And then you also have, right now, the UK has essentially age-appropriate design and the law. California will have age appropriate design into law as of, uh, when the bill takes effect. Uh, but that's a lot of people. I mean, I think you could see something done in Europe, the EU. Uh, I think you know California is 40 million Americans. So uh, I don't think the companies are going to want to design something totally different for certain geographies or for one state in particular than the, you know somebody in, in in the Midwest or the South or wherever. Uh, they've got a completely different product. I mean, I'm sure they're capable of that, but my hope is that just making sure their product safe for children in California, and a lot of these companies that make these products are California companies, um, maybe we'll see sort of the national standard uh, that's, that's based on the California uh, legislation. Jordan Dick Eppard here. Um, are you in touch with uh, members of Congress from California who have worked on the uh, Kids Online Safety Act, which is, we think, got a chance in Congress in the next months. Uh, have you looked at that legislation and do you think that would be a positive step or does it not mean that much? What What are your views on that? Yes, sir. I my two congressmen, Blue Carball and Jimmy Panetta, I think they're open to it. Uh, I think uh, it devils in the details on whether it be a positive step. I think as long as there's no uh, arguable preemption uh, where the, the, it's going to get taken to court and the tech companies can use it in court to argue that it preempts what was done in California, then I think it's all good. Um, so as long as preemption stays out of it, then I think it's a, a, a net that benefits the society. And, you know, we, we had it on a federal level, to my knowledge, strengthen those child protection laws in quite some time. So I'd love to see a bipartisan uh, coalition really get that push through. Thanks so much, Assembly Member. Let's give him a round of applause again. So I'm very excited to be moderating this panel um, with my two co panelists here, who I'll introduce. Nicole Gill is the co founder and executive director of Accountable Tech. Previously, she held executive positions at various nonprofits and campaigns uh, seeking to enact social change, including executive director at Tax March, campaign director at The Hub Project, and a vice president at SKD Knickerbocker. Josh Golan is the executive director of Fair Play, where he started as an intern in 2003 and must have liked it because he has been there ever since, <laughs> uh, helping it grow to be the leading national advocacy organization 
dedicated to countering the harmful effects of commercialism on children. So thank you for, for being here. Um, so we just heard from uh, the assembly member about the bill, uh, how it got to the governor's desk, sort of his perspective on the politics around that. I would love to hear, and we'll start with you, Nicole, about the civil society perspective. Can you give us a little color about how the coalition came together and what some of the tactics were that made an impact? Yeah, sure. So I realize we're the last thing standing between you and happy hour, maybe. So uh, we'll try to make this interesting. Um, so the California Age Appropriate Design Code, um, I got involved in Accountable Tech, got involved in the late winter um, of this year. And uh, I want to just first recognize the organization that really is behind the code. Um, the code, like uh, Assemblyman Con uh, Cunningham said, is modeled off of the UK Age Appropriate Design Code, which was completely designed and spearheaded by the Five Rights Foundation, led by Baroness Biban Kidron. Um, and if you ever have the chance to meet Biban, she is a absolute force of nature, um, and it is not surprising to me at all that this bill passed with her walking the halls of Sacramento. Um, the bill is really interesting to me, and one of the reasons why we were so eager to get behind it is because it aims to affect and protect kids by default and design. So it comes in at an upstream level. It affects how a product is designed and ensures that products have to be designed in a way that protects the privacy, safety, and health of anyone under the age of 18. Um, and a lot of the times, you know, this is not unique to tech, but in a lot of public policy areas, we are focused on fixing a problem after. And what is unique about the code is that it is providing basically a floor of standards that tech companies have to meet in all of their products and letting the companies figure out how to get there. So I don't know anything about technology. I can barely use Instagram anymore. I should not be involved in any way in writing legislation that dictates uh, how a, a platform or app should work. And so um, the way that the bill works is just a little bit differently than a lot of the other public policy interventions we've seen. And I think that's also why there was such a broad coalition of support for this bill. And that was something that the coalition really focused on. Um, this might only be something that can work in California because of its unique place in the country and, and how it sees itself kind of as a leader in the country. But there was a big focus to get groups outside of the state and kind of outside of the um, I don't say typical in a derogatory term, but more typical kids protection space involved. And so um, a lot of outreach to medical professionals, um, the AFT, the teachers union played a big role. Um, there were tech companies that got involved. You know, we're not typically an organization that does state policy, but we did. Um, and I think building such a broad, diverse coalition allowed us to speak to many different audiences as a part of that. Um, and, you know, two other major areas of focus for the bill, um, one of which, you know, Kristen talked, I mean, incredibly movingly early about her experience with her family and her son and centering stories like Kristen's and her family's was, in, was very important to the bill. And so organizations like Fair Play, um, like Parents Together, really um, worked with parents to help them understand how their voice could be utilized in a way that wasn't, you know, manipulative or um, you know, using people for their pain, which can happen. Um, the other area that was really unique about this was we involved young people. Young people don't get asked about policy that affects them pretty much ever. And this bill is entirely about young people. And young people those who are under 18 right now, they've grown up on tech. They grew up with a device in their hands, right? And so they know it better than any of us. And it was important to us to ask them how they wanted to see laws developed to affect their usage of tech. They're not anti-tech. I'm not anti-tech. But what I am is anti, you know, no tech limits 
no tech laws. Um, and so I think that's a pretty good overview. Of that. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Josh, you know, let's get you in here too, because you've been involved in plenty of efforts, both at the state and federal level. Um, how did this one compare? How is it different? Or, or was it sort of following the same um, playbook as before? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, having the UK law, um, you know, because anytime uh, th there's there's policy proposals, we hear from big tech that this is going to break the Internet. And the fact that the age appropriate design code went in effect in the UK in September of 2021. And here we are uh, a year plus later and we still have an Internet um, contrast contrary to what Facebook said was going to happen. Um, I think was that was really important having it having a, a, a modeling after an existing law that that was going into effect. I think that um, the the other thing um, is that the moment is right. Um, you know, I think um, if you look at survey data, and we need more survey data, but the surveys that we have, it's very clear. Parents don't like the system that we have. Um, if you, when you survey kids themselves, they don't like the system that we have. I think some of the most interesting survey data we have are surveys that say things like, you know, more than 50% of teens wish social media was never invented. And yet they're not leaving social media, which I think speaks to how powerful a role social media plays in their life. They wish it didn't exist, but they won't leave themselves. Right. And and I think one of the most moving things you'll see with youth is they're not going to leave Snapchat. But my God, they don't want their younger brothers and sisters on Snapchat. Um, and that really, I think, speaks to what they're experiencing. Um, so the moment was right in that. We are at this cultural moment where we are re-examining um, the role of social media in our society. Um, it's no longer just about the fact that everyone's 401ks are going up. Um, it's, it's, it's about the real harms that are happening. And I think um, what people need is a belief that things could be different. Um, no, but if you ask just about any parent in this country and most teens in this country, is this the way you want to spend your time on social media? Is this the way you want your kids spending your time on social media? Is this what you want them seeing on social media? Almost every parent and many kids would say absolutely not, but they don't think it could be any different. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the things that was just so wonderful about the California campaign was that it took, uh, you know, it, a very smart and well-written legislation and it's gave people something to organize around people need something to organize around they need to believe that we can make a difference and that we can change um and 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 so i think right now what we're fighting is not necessarily like is there a problem what we're fighting is cynicism and inevitability and and a lack of hope and to me I want to scream the story of California from the rooftops every single day because people need to know that we can beat big tech and protect our kids because that's just what happened. So you both spoke about the important role that parent advocates like Kristen Bride and, and young people had in moving this campaign forward. Can you give a little more specifics about what that actually looked like in practice? Yeah, I think I'll focus more on young people and Josh can pick up the parents angle. We're both parents too, so and a very different age groups. And so we experience this in our own lives, which is probably something I think anyone brings to the table with this issue. Whether or not you're a parent, you know a young person, you have a child in your life that you care about, and, and it becomes very personal very easily. Um, and that, that to some extent works in its favor in this issue. Um, so we uh, collaborated with a group founded by two groups founded by two young ladies, um, Eliza Coppins and Emma Lemke, and they founded two organizations before the age of 20. So, you know, I feel like I'm not doing enough in my <laughs> life, but um, the log off movement and technically politics and those two organizations have really catalyzed and garnered um, other youth advocates to come together, kind of understand what advocacy is, what it could look like, what, what their voices can be used for. There's a lot of young people who understand there's a problem, um, but they don't know how to play a role in the solution. And that's what these youth-led organizations did. Um, and Accountable Tech, the organization I run, is incubating the Log Off project, um, and we're hoping to help Emma grow the project so that it kind of starts chapters at college campuses around the country. Emma is 19. Um, she is 
in her second year of university at Washington University in St. Louis. And, you know, this is what she does in her spare time. Um, together, those young ladies and, and my team created this campaign called Design It For Us. And Design It For Us was a multimedia effort um, that encouraged people of all ages, but especially young people to tell the world who they wanted tech to be designed for and why. And so, like Josh said, a lot of young people said, my younger brother or my siblings. Um, and I think what was also different about this particular effort and Design It For Us lives on, we're, we're thinking about ways to utilize the campaign moving forward, is that it harnessed this positive energy that young people have. They're not negative about tech. They're, they don't want it to necessarily just go away. They understand the nuances, but they also have more hope and more energy around it than, than most folks I know. And the campaign allowed them to kind of harness that and, and put it at the forefront of our messaging and our coalition building. And yeah, and on the parents front, um, I mean, first of all, um, Kristen and the work group that she mentioned, um, uh, they went with with the organization Parents Together, which is just an amazing organization at organizing parents and and um, their entry into the tech accountability movement a few years ago has really just been an incredible boost because um, organizing parents is hard. Um, their parent, you know. Uh, I'm a, uh, I, I've been to many protests in my life. And one of the things you notice at protests is there's people who are 20 and there's people who are 60 and there's like in between, they're not there because they're so busy and so stretched. Um, so organizing parents is hard and parents together did an amazing job. Um, some of the things that they did included bringing Kristen and other survivor parents uh, to Sacramento to speak directly to lawmakers. Um, I also think it's really important as we're talking about this, the stories, putting a face to this like Kristen does is incredibly important. It's also important to capture the smaller everyday harms that occur on these platforms and that parents are struggling with. And so lots of parents weighed in talking to their legislators, letting them know that this is a winning political issue. Um, it really is. And so when I see I see federal legislators like not taking a stand on this, it, it boggles my mind. I mean, do you not want parents' votes? Um, like that's that's a pretty big constituency, parents. Um, so I think that those parents who were able to articulate the everyday sort of smaller struggles that accumulate um, and lead to harm slowly over time, as well as those really um, just heartbreaking stories that are literally life and death um, was really, really important. And, and, and especially in California, a state that obviously the tech industry is responsible for a lot of the jobs to let politicians know that they're, we've got your back on this issue, that there, um, that there is, this is a winning issue, that this is, um, you know, that, that perhaps standing up to one of your funders is, this is a place to do it, um, not just because it's the right thing, but also because it's a winning a winning issue. So it was really incredible to see how many parents came together. Um, some of them, you know, working tirelessly like the, the the work group, but others, you know, just meeting with their assembly member or calling or emailing. Um, it really made a huge difference. And so we heard from Assemblyman Cunningham about some of the hurdles that he faced inside the legislature. Can you tell us what it was like from the civil society perspective? You know, how did you feel the weight of of big tech against this effort? And how did you uh, take away or how did you overcome that? What are some lessons learned? Yeah, I think Congressman or sorry, Assemblyman Cunningham mentioned some of the trade groups that are built like there is just so much money that tech companies are throwing at this um, because their money depends on it, right? Like, let's not forget that under all of this is a is a profit, is a for-profit business. And these businesses need the next generation of users. It, it's just that. That's all this is, is that kids will be their next customers. And so they need to secure them now. Um, I, I, you know, con sorry, Congressman, Assemblyman, I was giving you a promotion. Assemblyman Cunningham um, mentioned the other bill that was introduced um, in session 2408. Um, our experience on the outside was a little different, I would say, than his. Um, those two bills are very different. One was a social media addiction bill. It gave parents the right to sue companies. Uh, 20, 2273, the age-appropriate design code, 
bill was about design. Sorry, I, I don't know if this is cutting out. I mean, I'm pretty loud, but um, so do I have to use the mic? Okay, sorry. This one's funny. Um, a lot of reporters, a lot of advocates, they conflated the two bills. And so it was very hard to constantly explain how they were different and why, and, and frankly, some groups only supported one of the bills over the other. Um, and so we had to do a lot of explaining about that nuance. And, and for me, that was a big challenge. Um, even getting folks in the tech accountability space to understand the nuance between them was, um, was, was certainly challenging. I think, um, you know, one of the lessons from that is I, you know, I, and I don't know, Nicole and I may disagree a little bit on this, but I, from where I sat, having the, um, the social media addiction bill was incredibly important because it was where the tech industry spent a lot of their resources trying to kill it and then made the design code bill look like the reasonable bill. Um, and I think that was helpful. What was not helpful was having the two same assembly people introduce the bills. And so that just added to all the confusion. And, um, and, and frankly, the social media addiction bill was a little sexier. And so early on, like that was what was getting all of the press. And I think it made it harder for the design code to, to get some of the uh, attention that it needed. Um, but at the end of the day, obviously um, it passed. So, so that, that's, that's fantastic. I think the other thing that I think we saw within civil society is um, some of the more libertarian leaning groups, um, you know, continuing to say that this is going to break the internet, that this is going to require every company to um, do facial recognition so they can figure out who's a kid and who's not a kid. There's nothing in the bill that says anything even remotely like that. Um, you know, I think there's, there is, um, you expect disinformation to come about bills from the tech industry when they come from some of your civil society groups. It's a little frustrating. Um, and that was certainly something that we saw here. And I'm not just talking about, you know, AstroTurf groups that that um, that are, that have a whose job is it is to spread disinformation about policy, but but groups who we felt should have known better were were spreading some different disinformation about the bill. And that was really um, concerning. So what's next? What is the, the playbook at the state level for moving forward? Are you going to try to replicate the California model? Is that too progressive for other states? Sort of are states even the place to be doing this or what's what's next? Yeah, I think states are the place to be doing this. Um, you know, federal legislation, Josh is much more of an expert in that than I am and has been working on it for much longer than I have. Um, but states are the laboratories that we have to kind of experiment and take some of this legislation and try it out. And, um, you know, there is a long history in the country of state by state efforts that then boil up into a national effort or a federal effort. We've seen that on other issues. Um, and I think that is possibility with the kids code. And that is something that we're thinking about um, future states to go to proactively. There are some legislators that are already reaching out to us to talk about the code. Um, so we're hoping to bring it to some other states in 2023 and beyond. And Josh can talk about federal. Um, and before I get to federal, I just wanted to say, I think one of the really important things about bringing this to states is not just to have this be a law on the books in, in more states where the companies will have to comply there. But what we've seen, um, you know, one of the most promising areas on, on kids is um, what's going on with the state attorneys general right now. And you have multi-state, um, huge multi-state investigations against TikTok and Instagram right now and their effects on, on, on teen mental health. And so the more AGs that are empowered by this law and have new authority under this law, it creates the opportunity um, for really exciting and interesting multi-state AG work, which I think would be a critical piece of this. On the federal level, um, you know, we are huge supporters of the Kids Online Safety Act. Um, it, the Kids Online Safety Act uh, is not the same as the age appropriate design code, but it has many of the same fundamental things in it, which I think are so important. So for instance, it has the duty of care 
uh, which um, we've been talking about all day. There's the, the, the social media companies are only responsible to their shareholders and their profits right now. It has a duty of care that says, no, you have a duty to prevent and mitigate harm to young people. Um, it protects kids where they actually are. Um, on the only law we have right now on the books uh, that protects kids online um, only applies to sites that are child directed. Um, kids are not on sites that are considered child directed or sites that are really aimed at preschoolers. And so the, the places that our kids actually are or not, are not protected right now. Um, there's a lot of other similarities. So the, the having to having to uh, assess the impact of your algorithms and and how they're affecting uh, young people's development and well-being. So to me, um, the next step, um, because we have legislation that is passed out of the Senate Commerce Committee with a 28 to zero vote, is to push as hard as we can in the next two months on COSA. And I know we're going to be talking a little bit more about this later, but um, you know, and I think California is a great model that can be replicated in other states, and we can walk and chew gum at the same time and push for the best federal legislation that we've seen in a really long time um, that has huge bipartisan support um, and, uh, and, and no preemption. So it's not like we have to choose between one or the other. Great. Thank you both. Um, I could ask you a million more questions, but I'm going to open it up to the audience here. Um, yeah, right here. Hi, thanks um, so much. I'm Eileen Hirshnov from uh, ADL. Uh, and before ADL, I was the general counsel and head of uh, public policy at the Wikimedia Foundation, which operates Wikipedia. Uh, first of all, congratulations. I think organizing, doing this legislative campaign, organizing, community organizing, grassroots organizing is the hardest and most wonderful thing. So kudos to you. I'm now going to be obnoxious and going to try to squeeze in two questions. <laughs> um, you see if you'll, you will see if uh, I'm allowed by the moderator. The first is undoubtedly an uneducated question. I can understand, but my question is why, particularly when it's about design, passing something in California isn't as good as Congress and applies to all things. You talked about replicating. I can understand some of the advertising or data protection and rights where a tech company can segment out by state where people are, but isn't it just as good or why isn't it if you, um, you know, pass something in California isn't even stronger than like the, the auto industry, what the emissions are in California is going to be the rest of the country kind of thing. But haven't you just done it when it comes by to this sort of child protection or say like an anti-hate by design? Doesn't that apply now to the whole U.S.? Why or why not? And second thing is you built this really great coalition in California. It did a one and done this coalition, what's it, are you going to keep it together or going to use it for something else? The band is staying together. Um, that is for sure. Um, so on the first question, the, the legal answer is no, it actually doesn't apply beyond the borders of California. It, it, the only thing that these companies have to do by this law is enforced it followed the letter of the law in the state of California. If they choose, you know, there's a reason why you do this, which is what you you gave the example of car emissions, right? If you do it somewhere, you expect they'll do it everywhere. That's also why passing the bill in the UK was done with the expectation that it would expand most likely. And we're hopeful that that will happen. We won't see that until 2024 when it starts to take effect. Um, but legally, they don't have to. They can they can certainly find a way to geo target this. And I don't you know I don't know anything about tech really um, to just count within the California borders. Um, and then yeah, the coalition I think is you know Josh and I work together on lots of other issues around this. And this is one of the spaces where there is genuine cooperation. I think I've, I've worked in a number of different issue areas in my career. And um, there is kind of a, a sense that we're all working for a higher purpose when it comes to this work. And you see that from the members of Congress, you you hear it from them, you can see it in their actions and they care so deeply about this and, and you see it in the grassroots organizing on this. Um, and so the coalition, you know, will will hope to expand our efforts. And and I would just add, um, you know, we hope, um, as Nicole said, that that when this 
goes into effect in California that other that it will be easier for the tech companies just to have one version of Instagram, one version of Snap. But we know already from uh, from countries that have even fewer protections in the United States. Um, and, and Francis talked a little bit about this this morning, that, that they have less safe versions of their products where there is less regulation. So I don't think we can um, rest for a minute and expect that the California, it's, it's you know, it's not a physical car in the same way. Um, so, um, you know, and, and I mean, if you look at um, the global South and protections that kids have there, um, even less than what they have here, um, it's not that hard for them to, to turn these features off. Um, in, in in certain places, though it will be easy to shame them if they do. I mean, it's that's I mean that's one thing that we will have going. There's no reason why a child in Nevada should not get the same protection as California, right? That's the argument that we're going to make in two years if that's not the case. Hey guys, um, obviously it's, it's an enormous accomplishment that you got this done. So I just first want to acknowledge you for pushing this across the line. I know it's been many years battling this. And uh, since meeting um, Baroness Biban Kidron in the UK in 2017, I've just seen how long it's taken to get at this point. So I really acknowledge what you've done. Um, I wanted to first, um, uh, one of my meta concerns is that the evolutionary pace and speed of which technologies kids are living on or democracies are living on is moving at such a faster pace than we're regulating whatever that new technology is or that parental norms can form. And one of the thoughts I, I just had, and I know you've been talking to the attorneys general, is that um, actually, if you had to guess, how much money do you think that the truth campaign, so out of the, the big tobacco uh, litigation, the truth campaign gets this huge payout per year. Anybody have a guess about how much that is? Do you know, actually? It's $100 million a year. So there is a hundred million dollars a year put into the immunity of the population to a toxic industry. A hundred million dollars of awareness and advertising campaigns. Would you say that social media is at least 10 times as harmful as tobacco, right? And that's, that would make it, if you, if you just do a math, right? I mean, we're talking, what would we live in a world where you have a billion dollars a year going to a truth campaign for tech so that culture can stay up to date and keep pace with the fast pace of tech. Because we need a constantly informed public, not at the scale of, hey, issue one raised $250,000 for the council. And we did this one grant and we've got a handful of nonprofits who are scraping together some grants from foundations. Let's live in a world where we have a billion dollars a year going into the constant upregulating of, of understanding, I think. And I just, I, I wanted just to add that because I think that the litigation part you talked about in addition to what you're doing, how do we just keep that feedback loop moving faster? Because if the virus moves faster than your immune system, you're going to die. Well, I think a couple of things. I mean, first of all, um, legislation is so slow and it is always going to be, you know, decades behind what the tech companies are doing. Regulators move faster. Um, they don't move as fast as tech, but they move a lot faster than uh, than legislation. And so, legislation that empowers regulators is really, really, really important, whether that's the FTC or state attorney general, um, that, you know, that's one of the key things when we're looking at legislation, that's one of the first things we're looking at is, is this going to empower regulators to make rules and to bring enforcement actions that are quicker than legislation. Um, but we need all the tools in the toolbox. Um, you know, we need, you know, if there was a master settlement agreement against social media companies, um, I don't think there's a person in this room who would uh, who would object to that. And, and, and you know, uh, a truth campaign similar to what's happened in tobacco. I do worry, like when people say, oh, we need to educate the kids in the schools and things like that. Like, man, talk to a teacher or an administrator these days about what it's like you know, they're quitting in droves, um, teaching kids, they're, like putting that another burden on schools is just, it's too much, um, you know, and and social media, as um, as Kristen said before, I mean, social media is making the, the school's job so much harder to begin with. So yes, litigation, as much litigation as possible. Um, let's get to a master settle, let's get discovery. First of all, <laughs> let's get to a, a settlement agreement that includes those things. But, um, but the you know, empowering regulators is a big part of this too. Yeah, just two other pieces quickly to add on to that. Um, 
one is I don't know that the message is as simple as it is around cigarettes, right? It's don't smoke. This is not don't use the internet, right? It, it, there's a ton of, you know this better than anyone, like nuance here. Um, so I'm not sure how that, that would be one hell of an ad campaign. Um, the other thing is, Parents also cannot be held responsible for the what the designs are of these companies. Parents can't keep up, right? If kids can barely keep up, if we can, can't keep up and we do this for a living, we are putting so much pressure onto parents to own this for their children. And many people in this room are parents and involved parents and we care about our children we want the best for them not every child has that not every child has a parent at home who can take the time to look at the privacy settings if they can figure out how to get there in snapchat in tiktok in facebook to turn off the automatic geo tracking to turn off the ability for strangers to message to private message children under the age of 18 those are things that are allowed right now on these platforms. We cannot keep burdening parents, teachers, other educators to become tech, tech experts in addition to their primary job as educators and parents and the people who nurture and care for our children. And, and just one other thing too, which I think is really important about what happened in California is yes, the technology moves really, really fast, but the best interest requirement will apply to future technologies as well. Like doing things like banning autoplay, like yes, the tech companies will innovate and find other ways to addict kids besides autoplay. Though I think banning autoplay in the short term has, has effects, but the best interest requirement is something that you can use to apply to future technologies, right? I mean, the, the, what the metaverse is gonna have to comply with with the best interest requirement. So I think that that's one thing that's really, really important is that duty of care um, is, is, does lead to some of that future proofing that you need. I think that's all the time uh, we have for questions. But join me in thanking Nicole. Uh